Hey guys, what's up? Murder of Birds here, and this is going to be my review for Ruby Volume 3. Finally, I know, right? Volume 3, Episode 1, Round 1. Uh, I also did a live reaction for you guys. If you guys want to check that out, it's on my channel, or I'll leave it in the description, either or. But this is a an amazing return to form, you know what I mean? With all things considered, you know, Monty's passing and, you know... The Rooster Teeth team, you know, Miles and Carrie and Gray really taking, you know, at the helm now and really um, pushing the story still with the same integrity, with the same expectations and, you know, the same things that we've known and loved for so long. And I'm so, I'm so happy and glad, you know, I felt, I watched this episode and I, I, I literally felt at home. Like I felt at peace with myself knowing that Ruby is back. You know, it's been, it's been a year, you know what I mean? So... You know, with all things considered, with Monty no longer being with us, he's with us in spirit, and I felt like he was with us in this episode, and I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. But getting into the episode, obviously, first and foremost, first thing I gotta say is I, the production value is definitely noticeable, it's improved uh, tremendously, um, and just to give a comparison of the three intros, Volume 1 and Volume 2, you know, like, we already know about Volume 1, I feel like at this point, that's kind of like the rough sketch compared to Volume 2, and especially now... Uh, you know, with the shadow people and the stiff animation and things of that nature. And obviously the fact that they were, you know, the actors were really getting into their characters, understanding how each character works and becoming more comfortable with, you know, voice acting with them and stuff like that. So, and no, and no one was really established. So, Volume 1 to me is kind of like the rough draft. Volume 2 just took it to a whole nother level, got rid of the shadow people, made fodder people here and there, made it more lifelike, made the city more lifelike, made the animation more lifelike. They had, they added ambience and all of the stuff shading it just made it a much better experience especially when it came to the you know to the to the fighting scenes and such in volume three the jump isn't as exponential as one to two but it's still noticeable mainly in like the facial expressions and the movements i noticed like when ruby was talking to her mother or when emerald was talking to team ruby and stuff like that just the movements of ruby's eyes and her and you know her gestures as she was moving around or emerald's hair moving back and forth i was just like I can't believe they've improved, you know what I mean? Like, I thought Volume 2's, you know, production was really awesome with what they had, but it seems like they've upped the ante yet again, and I feel like at this point, at this point, Volume 4, Volume 5, however many that go down the line, it's gonna, it, believe it or not, it's only gonna get better, and I think that's fantastic. I can only, I only dream of what Ruby will look like as the years go down the road, you know what I mean? So, that, first and foremost, was one of the things that struck me immediately you know and it came down you know with the with the vital festival and with the action and with the environments and with the giant stadium with all the people in it and it just looked fantastic so first things first ruby and summer have a moment or more important or i guess you would say ruby had a moment with her mother so aside from her trailer because we already know that that's a backstory she hasn't been to see her mother in a while and when we when she last went to see her mother there was snow there was it was like the winter so now it's the fall or the autumn season so it's been almost a year and um i really like this interaction i feel like we needed this for a while to really get ruby's perspective on how her relationship or how she deals with her mother not being around or what it's like when ruby goes to visit because we we've gotten some context from yang of how ruby handled her mother's you know, her mother's absence when she was young, and we got a little bit of backstory, but that was from Yang's perspective. Now for Ruby, you know, Ruby, that's Summer's child, you know what I mean? And I really enjoyed this, I really like this, and I don't know about any of you guys, but during this monologue, I guess I guess you could say it's also a dialogue, she's talking to her mother, um, I was thinking about Monty, you know what I mean? Um, he was an incredible person, he was one of a kind, truly one of a kind, in talent, in enthusiasm, in creativity, in, in everything, and I couldn't, I got a little bit emotional as I was watching it, because I was just like, <sighs> you know what I mean, like, it's just really unfortunate, and I kind of had an understanding that this scene was to replicate both sides of the story, like, understanding Ruby situation with her mother not being around and understanding us as a community whether it be rooster teeth community or the ruby fandom of not having monty around anymore and i, I kind of took it as both ends you know what i mean uh 
So what I can say that I really appreciated from this interaction between uh, Ruby and her mother was that you got to really see how Ruby has developed and grown literally from volume one, even into volume two to now. You know, it's been, I think, about a year's time, almost a year's time since she's been at Beacon. And that's been an entire year to really see how she's grown as an individual, as a huntress in training, as a team leader, as a person. You know what I mean? Like, we remember Ruby in Volume 1 as a kid who was really awkward and was really out of place being jumped two years at an academy and didn't really understand the fundamentals of being a team leader and, you know, had a lot to learn. And now we really see how she's more confident in herself, really relying and falling back on her team, appreciating the fact that she has her sister there and all the things that she's been through so far you know with stopping the white fang and Torchwick and all that other stuff and meeting some teachers you know getting some interaction with Ublek and stuff so I'm really glad that we get to see that context um in this you know real you know with her relaying all this to her mother and it just shows that you know no matter where Summer is and I, I I'm still saying this I don't think Summer is a fish is like really gone in a sense but it's really great to just see how Ruby really confides a lot in her mother and confides in the things that she's done and just wants her mother to be proud of her, you know. And she mentioned, too, like, mother like daughter, so I can only imagine. So I'm more confident in saying now, because I've already had somewhat speculations in the past, I'm more confident in saying now that another reason why she wants to be a huntress is, I mean, let's be real, her mother was a huntress, so... All those things considered, uh, one thing, one little snippet that I took from that as well was uh, Ruby mentioned that Yang has gotten better at fighting and that she's learned a lot from her dad. So I'm assuming that Tai Yang is also like uh, like a hand-to-hand -hand fighter similar to Yang. I don't know what his weapon is or anything. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if she got her weapons made by him. Well, not by him, but if you know, he kind of put it in her ear to be like, hey, this is how you should make your weapons to complement your fighting that I taught you or that you learned from me. So there's that. So, and then there's one more thing in this. Like, again, it goes back to Monty in a sense. And I feel like this was like an ode, like a thank you for everything, a tribute almost. So at the very end of the scene, when, you, when Ruby turns around and she's like, oh, dad's bringing me to go to the festival and all that stuff. Wish me luck. It was nice to see you. The scene at the sun in the background it showed the sun in the background, and then it showed some birds flying off. And I, and I, I stopped the video afterwards. I rewatched it because obviously I was in the moment with my live reaction. I stopped the video, and I was like, huh. I think that's like an ode to Monty. I have this card right here. For any of you guys who don't know how Monty's signature is, it's like a giant O for Ohm as well as the O in Monty. This is a card from the Ruby trading cards, and it has like the... Like the it has the... Uh, I can't even speak right now. It has the autographs of Miles, Carrie. This right here, oh, oh, hold on. This right here is Monty's signature, as you can see. If you look at it carefully, you can see that the giant circle would represent the sun, and then the little squiggles would represent the birds. I think that was kind of like a tip to the hat, like an ode, like I said, to Monty, of like, this is your work. The birds representing like going off to the distance like Monty's no longer with us. He's in a better place, but your your legacy will still continue and live on. So I really think that that's what it was. And I really think that was an awesome take on it. Similar to like the opening, like I meant, um, I didn't mention it, but that I've been thinking of like the petal falls down at the, t at the beginning and it lands like next to the rose. And it says right there, a series created by Monty Ohm. And again, I feel like that's like an ode to him. Like the last, like the last petal hasn't fallen yet. And, you know, the story isn't over and it's still going to continue. And similar like the Rose, Summer Rose, I mean, Ruby Rose, rather, you know, being like one of the first characters that he thought of when he had this idea for this show. So I'm digging really deep, but I'm, uh, that's what the review is all about, I guess. So moving on from there, we have the Vital Festival Tournament. We have Amity Coliseum up in the sky, which it looks badass. It looks way better than what I thought it was going to look from the, from the World of Remnant. And I think Amity means like friendship or relationship or something like that so it's like friendship coliseum if i'm not mistaken i think that's what amity means but anyways um so this is a wide scale wide scale spectacle you have people coming in from the different areas to watch at the actual coliseum but then you also have it broadcasted to all of the different nations you have it at Vale, mistral vacuo and atlas so i thought that was really awesome and the, another cool thing was like the world of Ruby to us is really small in the, when, when you think about what we've been exposed to so far, but it's much more grandier. So you have, so 
like I mentioned, like you have the different environments. So you see like the different, you see people watching at, at bars and you see people watching on at, like outside, outside, you know, like in the wilderness and stuff like that. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ, like this world is gigantic. I wonder if we're ever going to leave Vale because we've only really dabbled a bit in Vale and Beacon and, uh, you know, Mountain Glen, which is kind of an expansion, but it's in a nearby place. So we haven't expanded to any other kingdoms, you know what I mean? We haven't experienced, like, the cultures outside of Vale and stuff like that. But everybody else is coming here, obviously, for the, excuse me, for the tournament. So, really excited, really interested to see that. Uh, so following all of that, we're getting right into it. And they show off the scene, or I guess the full, the finished product. And this was the scene that they showed between Team Arburn and Team Ruby at the RTX Ruby panel, uh, RTX 2015. Um, and I got to see the sneak preview of it uh, on the Facebook group. So that was pretty awesome. And this is where we got revealed of the characters. You have Arsene Alton, who is the team captain, uh, Reese Cloris, Bolin Hori, and Nadir Shiko. Now... Something really threw me, it didn't throw me off, but I'm kind of like in the dark right now, and I don't have internet, so I have nothing to grasp at here, so if any, just let me know, I want to actually know if any of you guys know this, or if you can give me the information in the comments, who are these characters based off of, you know what I mean, because... All of the characters or all of the primary characters or known characters of the series are based or referenced from fairy tales and myths. You know, you have Red Riding Hood, you have Joan of Arc, you have the Monkey King, but I really can't gauge what who any of these characters are based off of from their attire, from their weapons, or anything like that. But I did write a little bit down between each character and basically an analysis of their team. So they're from Haven. So, I'm wondering if they have a relationship with Team Sun, because from what we know so far, I don't know if it's just basically Scarlet and Sage who are the oddballs, but we know that uh, Sun and um, and Neptune are from Haven, and I'm assuming that's where they're, they're from when it comes to them coming uh, to Vale for the tournament. And that means they both, um, Team Arburn and Team Sun, go to the same school, and they represent that, you know, so I'm, I'm also assuming if it's like two, two schools... I mean, two teams per school. So you have Team Ruby and Team Juniper representing Beacon. You'd have Team Sun and Team Arburn representing Ve uh, ha uh, Haven. Um, or, or uh, yeah, representing Haven. And then, um, and then so on and so forth. So I'm wondering that. But I'm wondering if they have a relationship with Team Sun. Aside from that, Arslan Alton, hand-to-hand -hand fighter, was fighting against Yang. And it seems like she's a martial artist to some degree. Her weapon, I'm assuming, is like a wire or a string. I don't know if she... I think she has like like bandages or something wrapped around her wrist and her legs or something. Because she used... She kind of caught Yang off guard when she kicked... When she like pulled her in with the wire on her foot and then kicked her. Excuse me. So, that's really cool because we already understand, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. You got to get really close to the competition. But those wires or those strings can kind of act as an extension of herself. So, she can kind of fight close-range combat, but from a distance. Or to pull somebody in if they're too far. And she kind of did that with Yang. And then again, she did that for Traversal when she was sliding on the ice. So, I think that's pretty awesome. Um, don't know if that's her weapon, uh, per se. But that's what she used. So, that's what I'm going with. Um... From there, Reese Cloris, which is probably my favorite one, based on her design, based on like her demeanor while she was fighting against Blake. She uses a dust hoverboard, which is super badass, which also splits and doubles as dual pistols. Uh, no pun intended of you know doubling as, but um, I think that's super awesome too. Like she has, it's kind of like a really creative take, like. And it adds like a different dynamic to combat because she's actually able to traverse more quickly and then also use it in terms of attacking and moving at the same time and all that. She did get caught off guard by Blake and I will say Blake's definitely leveled up quite a bit when it comes to that. She went basically one-on-one -on -one with Chloris and, and pretty much took care of her on her own. Got her out by aura level and by knockout. So even if you cancel out the knockout because that could be a cheap way of winning, she still won via aura level. So I think that was super cool. Uh, then you have Bolin Hori, who he comes off as a monk to me based on his attire. He has, like, the long uh, robe, and he has, like, beads on his hand as well. And he has a staff or a pole or something. So, um, not much really to go off of him. And then Nadir is the one that's the most, the most, not bland, but the one that I couldn't pick the most off of because he didn't really, he didn't really do much. Um... He had a rifle, and that's really all I can really say. And his attire is kind of unique in a sense. Uh, makes me wonder where he comes from originally. Like, 
not from the school that he's from, but where he's from himself. And it seems like they kind of all have, they all like descend from a, a type of ethnicity. Um, at least, at least Bolin and uh, Arslan uh, from my perspective. So that's what my take on the, on this new team. I think they, I don't know if they're going to be like a new B-list team, if they're going to be flushed out like Team Juniper or even expressed a little bit like Team Sun. Um, but they are expressed in terms of pushing the plot of the tournament and seeing what they can do. Four new characters already, and we got four more characters at the end going up against Team Juniper. So I already feel like unless these characters are just fodder for the for the plot of the vital tournament, I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed right now. On top of who Team Sun's gonna go up against, you know, Cinder's team's gonna go up against, and how it's gonna trickle down to like the final combatants. So from there, within the battle itself. There was a lot of synergy between Team Ruby, and it shows that they've only gotten better from Volume 2. Like, from Volume 2, we know, like, the food fight, they were kind of all doing their own thing. And then when it came time to fighting off uh, the Elysian Paladin that Roman was in, they really came together, and they had, like, their, co their combination attacks based off of the names of the shipping, which I think that's so freaking awesome that you kind of incorporate the community in that, because the community makes up the shipping names, and then you use them as team attacks. And in this one, it was a lot more cohesive. Everyone was a part of it, you know what I mean? And especially the final the final push, I guess you would say, with Yang taking out the last three team members of, of Arburn with you had you had Weiss make the giant ice wall, and then you had uh, you had Yang like firing off of it, gaining momentum, and then you had Bumblebee basically throw you, you had Blake throw the um, throw her uh, her gun which propelled her forward and then went off and then launched off of Ruby to launch Yang even further and just like add all that momentum into a final hit. And Yang's OP, you know what I mean? Like she got that shit done. So I thought that was super cool. I was like, damn, this team is, this team's awesome. This team's in rare form. They're more, they're more together. They're more cohesive. And it's really awesome to see how far they've come. They're going to the doubles round and, um, They've nominated Weiss and Yang, which that kind of took me by surprise because I, I honestly thought like, ultimately, I, I always thought that Ruby was destined for much more than anybody else just because of the fact of she, I feel like she's really special and I feel like that's the reason why Ospin let her in the school early, but um, all that aside, they ended up winning and then it transitioned into like a little powwow, a little downtime, you know, with them eating and stuff like that. And we got to see Team Juniper come around, and we got, and that's when the humor just busted out. Like the comedy and the, the you know, the comedic relief is really here, and it's not like they just put it on Jean as like you're the comedic dude. You're supposed to be funny. We got it all around. Ruby's dialogue the entire the entire episode was really funny and quirky and dorky and and lovable at the same time. Nora and her antics are still there, and um. You know, throughout, it was just really awesome. Oh, and the cat shtick. They're, they're going with it. So they gave Blake... <laughs> they gave Blake a giant bowl of fish when everyone else was having noodles. And I was just like, okay, so... She likes to eat tuna a lot. She obviously has cat ears, so she knows she's a cat. She ha they, They've done the laser pointer. They've done her relationship with Zwei, her being a cat. And now the bowl of fish. And it seems like they're, they're, they're going on with this. They seem like, like, I'm pretty sure the community, like, went freaking nuts when they saw that for the first time. But I love how they're going with that. You know what I mean? Uh, and it's just, like, a cool little cat shtick. And I hope they go along with it for a while. And there's so many other things, too. Like, bring in a ball of yarn. Give her some catnip. Do something. Like, I feel, it's just so freaking awesome how they do, <laughs> how they do that. But um, from there, we also see that um, during that interaction, they interact with Emerald a little bit, and she's keeping up appearances along with Emerald. They got information on who they're going up against the next turn in the next round in the doubles. And Neo is in the scene, so I, I I did a reaction to the trailer and I did an analysis, and I pretty much said I was like I feel like that's Neo in disguise because they know what she looks like, and Cinder's also she's changed her getup too because. You know, she can't wear the dress in the appearance because that would kind of tip them off because that's what she was wearing in, when they first met in Volume 1. And then Volume 2, she wore like her masquerade kind of outfit. She can't wear that. So she got she has a new getup again. So um, they're trying to keep up appearances. I'm waiting to see how they forward their plans or what they're really up to because right now they're just waiting. 
Um, and then Adam's nowhere to be found either. And then towards the end is the setup for the next episode, and I hate how they cut it off because I was so into it. And the episodes are getting longer and longer. But the next episode is setting up for Team Juniper to go up against the new team, Team Bronze from Shade, which I'm assuming that's the academy from Vacuo because we know, obviously, Beacon is in Vale, um, Haven is in Mistral, and then Atlas... I think it's called Atlas Academy or something like that. So Shade is from Vacuum. And you can also tell from their attire. They're kind of like ruffians a little bit. Like they have kind of like a rebellious type of style to their clothing. And it's all like mismatch. So there's that. Um, and they're going up in uh, forest and mountain and terrain. And one of them, one of the people on Team Bronze uses a sniper. So I feel like that's going to give the Team Juniper kind of problems. On top of the fact that Jean feels like he's got to, about to barf because he ate before fighting so i don't know how that's going to turn out so there might be a little bit of uh struggle between team juniper going up against this team but i still feel like they'll they'll pull out of it um and other than that that's 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 the uh that's the analysis that's the review uh and the last little bit that i'll mention because i kind of feel like it's already been expressed a bit from the song like from boop uh we also it also was confirmed that uh from nora that ren and nora don't have a home and they don't have parents so I'm not sure if the village that they were talking about in Volume 2 was where they were originally from or if they just wanted to pay it forward and help the, them out because they know what it's like to lose a family or lose a village or something like that. Clearly, they were the type of people like the nomads and the small tribes that lived outside the kingdoms and didn't have protection. And I'm assuming they just met with tragedy, losing their families. And I'm pretty sure that's how Nora and Ren ended up meeting, especially if you listen to Boop. That kind of really brings together the whole... Um, that kind of brings together the whole relationship factor of how Nora sees Ren and their relationship. So, that's it. That's my episode one review for Ruby Volume 3. Uh, very awesome episode. I'm going to be getting into episode two very soon. I hope you guys look forward to it. Leave me your thoughts of what you guys thought about this episode, what you guys thought about my reaction, anything that I mentioned, how you guys can bounce off ideas off of each other. And I will see you guys very soon for episode two. So, thanks a lot, and I'll see you later. Take care.